Hi guys. Let's talk today a little bit about nonverbal communication. Uh, we've talked about this some in our class already as we've talked about things like uh, our identities and how we sometimes express those through our clothes or through our hairstyles or through like religious jewelry we might wear. Um, those types of things all play a role in nonverbal communication. Let's talk about some other things. Okay, so uh, nonverbal communication is a process that's performed spontaneously. And um, it contains these non-linguistic behaviors that we often do subconsciously. I'll give you some examples as we go through this, okay? But we often are unaware that we're doing them. Um, they can be incorporated alongside an intentional verbal message, or they can be used alone um, to convey the whole message, okay? And what, of course, is the sort of the bane of our existence with nonverbal communication is they can also be misunderstood. Right? So uh, when we're communicating with people who have different nonverbal codes than we do, they can be misunderstood. Okay? Uh, so when we talk about nonverbal and verbal, um, they're very much connected. Okay? So um, when we have verbal communication, it's pretty unusual to have verbal communication with no nonverbal communication. So even as I'm recording this video, I'm having trouble keeping my hands still. Um, that I'm wanting to like use my hands or I'm using my hands under the table and you can't see them. Um, but also things like smiling and moving my eyebrows and trying to have eye contact, those things are all part of nonverbal communication. Okay. Um, also, nonverbal communication often has some sort of verbal component to it, okay, or is a trigger for that verbal communication. Um, so a couple of examples um, for a US American like me, um, when someone says something I don't believe, um, or don't like, um, then raising my eyebrows is a likely response, right? So I say something to my kids like, oh, somebody made a mess again. And my kids are like, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. And I'm like, mm-hmm, sure it wasn't, right? And so I do that eyebrow raise to indicate that I'm not um, fully believing what they say, okay? Another example um, is that a uh, U.S. American woman, someone like me, um, if you give me a compliment, like you say, oh, Karen, you are the most beautiful teacher that we've ever had. And I say, oh, that's so sweet, right? So the way that I tilt my head, smile, bring my shoulders to my ears, okay, um, is something that, that interestingly enough, we do kind of all across the culture or the language. Um, and it's something that no one ever teaches us, okay? Another example of us using that same gesture is when we see something really cute, um, so when I see a baby or a little piggy, or yesterday it was the hippopotamus at the Cincinnati Zoo, um, and then when I see it, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so cute, right? Um, and when we say that these things are part of our subconscious, nobody ever tells us, okay, now when you see something cute and you're a girl, you need to raise your um, shoulders and tilt your head and raise your voice a little bit as you say how cute that thing is. Right, we don't uh, get explicitly taught that, and yet lots of us do it exactly that way, um, which means that we're following some of those behaviorism things, uh, watching other people in our culture, okay, for appropriateness. All right, so we often think about nonverbal as being a silent language. Um, that's not a hundred percent true because some nonverbal communication still has a, a sound to it. Okay, um, there's no set of formal rules or dictionary to use. Um, so we do know that there are places where we have um, explicit rules, but for the most part, we don't. Okay? Um, but an example um, is that uh, some of us can have direct uh, opposites. So I told you um, in U.S. American English culture, um, when I raise my eyebrows, it often means I don't believe you. In Greek culture, it means no. Um, the way we shake our heads is another nonverbal sign. So I would say yes this way and no this way, um, but in Turkey or India or Albania or a number of other places there, um, this means yes and this means no. And that can be very confusing uh, where our messages contradict each other, okay? Also, nonverbal messages are continuous and they blend into one another. So it's really difficult for someone to say this nonverbal message goes with this specific verbal message. Um, or that um, this means this specific thing because we kind of use them all running into one another. Okay. So let's talk about the nonverbal with the verbal. Okay. So nonverbal um, often reinforces the verbal message. So something like, yeah, really great job. I'm really proud of you. I'm going to smile. I give the thumbs up and I'm nodding while giving the praise. 
Okay. It's uh, complementing or reinforcing that because the words alone are enough. Okay. Uh, we can also have it contradict. So something like, uh, man, he's really, really good looking. Wink, wink. Right. And I don't have to say wink, wink. Um, that was for emphasis. Um, but it is interesting how some of our nonverbal things have actually turned into verbal language as well. So um, we also have things like uh, using punctuation, like air quotes, um, is, has carried over from writing into now nonverbal. Okay? Uh, we also have places where nonverbal regulates the verbal. So um, this is something like during a conversation, we want to keep the conversation going. So we do it. We all do this, right? Um, someone says something and we're like, mm hmm, uh huh, yeah, mm hmm, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I agree. And we do those things to keep the conversation going. When we stop doing those things, um, we actually trigger a response from the other person. So either they look at us to make sure we're still paying attention, or on the phone, we might have something like, hey, are you still listening? So those cues are important. Now, those cues do make noise in some cases, right? The mm hmm, yeah, mm hmm, yeah, yeah. Okay. But uh, that noise is not necessarily considered verbal communication. Okay. It's still part of a nonverbal um, thing. So we also have situations where nonverbal substitutes for the verbal. So things like head nods, um, we have some hand gestures. The best example I can give you really is like at a party and you wanna leave, but you don't wanna say anything out loud and you see your friend across the room and you just kind of give a head nod, right? Like, like, hey, let's get out of here, right? Now you can use that in like a sexual way that's like, hey, let's get out of here. Um, but so there's still some context that's there as well. Okay, so we have uh, these different ways that nonverbal communication is displayed. We're gonna talk about each of these. Okay, but um, it's not just through the like the hand movements. Okay, um, it actually is a pretty complicated subject to study. Okay, so let's talk about body movements first. So um, we have some body movements um, where they have a direct verbal counterpart. So the peace symbol, uh, maybe flipping someone off, um, and those have a direct meaning um, where we can just use the hands instead of the language. Okay. We also have what we call illustrators. Um, illustrators are probably what I use the most of. Um, so I use my hands to emphasize, explain, or support the things that I'm saying. So I've told you guys that I often teach uh, English. So when I am teaching English, I do things like it's a big, big mountain. And I'm using my hands um, to mean big mountain. Now, if I just do this, it doesn't actually mean anything on its own, right? It only means something with the verbal language, okay? Um, other things like crying, smiling, laughing, blushing, um, things that display our feelings and our mood, and our mood um, are things also that um, have to do with kind of our body movements and our nonverbal communication, okay? We're giving information without actually having to say something specifically, okay? Uh, the regulators we've already talked about, so the nodding, eye contact, postural shifts. Um, there's a lot of study right now on postural shifts and how those indicate whether you're involved in the conversation or how close you feel to the participants. Um, one of the things that I ask you to do as a possible thing for your journal of violations that I think is really funny but would be really hard to do right now in isolation um, is to leave a conversation without saying anything. So usually we have a group of people and one of the things that we do as a regulator is we have to say something like, oh yeah, I've got to run or, you know, I'll talk to you guys later or something. But if you are in a conversation with a group of people and you just walk away um, without giving any sort of indication that it's time for you to go, um, that's super weird. And, um, and that's kind of a, a violation um, of a communication norm. Mm -hmm because we expect to have some sort of indication there that you're gonna leave the conversation. Okay, um, other types of adapters. So people, when they get really fidgety and they're you know, curling their hair or they're tapping a pencil or they start kind of um, doing something. I, if you've noticed me when I'm teaching, if I have a pen in my hand, um, I do some things with a pen. If I have a bracelet on, then I'm always like sort of spinning my wrist with my bracelet um, and those things, just sort of have to do with anxiety and and kind of regulating your your mood um but then people 
can also give cues about sort of where their psychological state is. So when I'm teaching a class, right, and students are like, okay, I'm done, like it's 3.20, let's get out of here. Um, they start cleaning up their stuff. They start looking at their backpacks. They look at the door. They might like look at the clock. But there are a lot of uh, movements that sort of indicate to me that they're finished. Okay, uh, let's talk about proxemics. Okay, so proxemics is the study of space and communication. Um, we have four zones, and we've actually touched on this a little bit already in our class. I want to start with the, the bottom one with public. Um, so when we're in a regular classroom and you have the teacher at the front and the students sitting in the chairs, um, then that's sort of like regular public format. It would be super weird if I walked into the classroom and you were all sitting on the floor right at the front in a circle, um, like kind of like kindergarten or first grade, like when people do floor time. Um, that wouldn't be very expected in our um, in our university setting. Right? We would expect instead that people would be um, spread out, that you'd be sitting in the chairs, um, that you'd be facing forward. Uh, those are the types of things we expect. Okay? Um, as we move up the list toward intimate, then we get a little bit closer in terms of space. So social space is something like I'm at a friend's house for a party, and at this party um, there are a bunch of people that I know and some that I don't know. And I'm probably going to, um, you know, be in the same room with them, but I'm not necessarily like close enough that I could touch them. Or if it gets really loud, I might get a little bit closer, but I get closer to the people that I am more intimate with. Okay, uh, personal and intimate. Um, so depending on your relationship with someone, um, I like to think about situations like if I'm on tracks. So if I'm writing tracks and I'm there with my spouse, with my husband, um, then we might have our arms interlocked or our legs touching, or he might have his hand, arm around me or something like that. Um, when I'm on tracks with my kids, um, sometimes my kids are in that intimate zone where they're like leaning up against me and I have my arm around them. Um, you know, when they were littler, they sat on my lap. Um, now that they're bigger though, we might actually be across from each other. Um, and chatting instead of being right next to each other. Okay, uh, we also have um, if if we're thinking about on the train and and like a social distance, right? It would be unusual if there are lots of spaces on the train for you to sit right next to someone. Um, you would first start to sit kind of across from people or a, you know in a different area than someone that you didn't know. And as more and more people get on, then that social space sort of gets smaller and smaller. Um, however, there are differences between cultures because when we talk about something like a train or a bus, um, what we as US Americans think is, is a full bus is not a full bus in most other parts of the world. And in fact, it can cause a conflict when people are trying to get on and they feel like there's still space, but others are like, oh, you know, I'm in as far as I can go. I can't get any closer to this person when actually physically you could get closer to that person and probably fit another 20 people on. Um, but we start to get uncomfortable in our social spacing and that can become kind of an issue. Um, so let's end here with space and we'll talk about touch next.